Welcome to another episode of Woman Witness Podcast of Stories at the Well. I'm your host, Leah Fortier. Here on this platform, we bring to you voices of women who are out there making a positive impact and making a difference in their lives and the lives around them. Today, I have a very special guest, Stephanie Strickland. I'm going to go ahead and read to you a little bit about her, and then we'll go ahead and introduce her. Stephanie Strickland is a survivor of domestic abuse, and she shares her journey of love, abuse, triumphs, and her latest book, Finding Peace Within. Through self-reflection, faith, and mixed martial arts, Strickland breaks down the strongholds in her life and inspires women to share their truth and break the cycle of insecurity. Today, she advocates for women and encourages them to fight for their lives and fight for the lives that they deserve. Without further ado, I want to introduce to you my special guest today, Stephanie Strickland. Hey, Stephanie, welcome to the well. Hello, Leah. Nice to meet you. I'm so glad to be here. So glad to have you here. And Stephanie, I told you a little bit when we spoke on the phone that your book is already making a splash and making a difference in so many lives. And it, personally, my mom picked up your book and she just could not put it down. So I can't wait to talk to you about your book today. I'm very excited to hear about that. Um, every time I, you know, someone tells me, hey, I read your book and I loved it. I just thank God for it because that he was the whole purpose behind me writing it. You know, Stephanie, that's what it's all about. That's why I have this platform. God pushed, he pushed me into doing this platform, Woman Witness. And it's all about us telling our stories and being a witness. So those who are in captivity, those who are hopeless, they perhaps can see the light at the end of the tunnels, hear, read your story and strive for that in their own lives. So thank you for being vulnerable. Thank you for being a witness and sharing your story. Okay, so let's jump right into it. I know I read a little bit about you, but tell us who you are. So I am Stephanie Strickland. Um, I'm an up and coming Arthur speaker. I live in Dallas, Texas, and I am a mother of three sons. I, I have four grandchildren and I'm just an advocate for women. Like I say, I'm, I talked about in my book after experiencing what I did, I just felt like I needed to have be that voice for women who don't have the voice. And maybe they can see that there is life after abuse. So that's kind of what I do. I volunteer a lot. I try to stay in depth and involved in anything that's going to empower women. Yes, I love that so much. Stephanie, thank you for sharing that about yourself. And being a boy mom myself, I have to ask you, do you have all your grandchildren, all four of them? Are they, do you get, you got some grand babe, grand girls in there? I do. I have two granddaughters. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Give me hope. I'm gonna get my girls one day. That's all right. <laughs> That's all right. Okay. Stephanie, you sent me some chapters in your book and I want to talk to you about the journey. And I looked over the book and I promised you these six chapters, they highlight it to me. And I really want to talk to you about them. So I will hope that you can walk us through without telling us too much of the book, because we do want you guys to get it. We also want you to understand the journey and how Stephanie maneuvered her way through her cycle of abuse and how you can maybe find restoration in your own lives should you be struggling in this area. So Stephanie, can you tell, please share a little bit about your journey and how you found the strength to leave your situation. I started out very young. I got married when I was 18. So let me back up a little bit. I was a teenage mother. Yeah. Um, I had my first son at 14. Mm -hmm. um, I had my second son at 17. And then I got married at 18. And then by the time I was 20, I had my third son. I was married by then. Yeah. So I came into my relationship with my ex 
with a lot of insecurities. I mean, mm. if you can only imagine being a teenage mother. Yeah. I had a lot of I had a lot of baggage coming in. Yeah. But I was determined to be that perfect wife. And I, you know, I had this image in my head of being the perfect wife and the fairy tale and I, I wanted it. I I had saw it. My aunt and uncle had been married for so many years and they had the, the marriage that I wanted. And so yeah. I came into my marriage thinking, yeah, I'm gonna be this perfect wife. Yeah. But the abuse started early in my relationship. I mean, all the red flags were there, but like yeah. I said, being insecure and not really knowing who I am, still being young and not knowing myself, I just allowed it to happen because I didn't know no better. You know, they say, if you know better, you do better. Well, I didn't know better. So I just thought that that was what it was all about. You know, the, uh, the arguing, the verbal abuse, the physical abuse. I just thought that that was what all marriages were about. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Stephanie, thank you. Thank you for being vulnerable and sharing that. And I know a lot of women can probably relate to it. And if you were to, you know, sit back and I'm pretty sure you talk about it in your book and I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, you know, looking back and saying, you know what, I was young. I didn't know any better. And now I know better. So now I'm teaching. Okay, so tell us the title of your book, Finding Peace from Within, suggests that there were early signs, like you said, in, in the be abusive behavior. So can you talk to us about some of those red flags that you noticed and why it's important for others to be aware of these signs? Sure, especially, like I said, especially as being as young as I was, you know, in my teens, my ex was very possessive. Yeah. You know, he always wanted to know where I was, always wanted to know what I was doing. If I was speaking to some other guy or another person, he didn't, it could be male or female. He didn't mm. like it. He was very mm. possessive and controlling. And to me, that was the red flag. Um, I try to tell a lot of teenage girls, mm -hmm. you know, if, if your boyfriend is constantly texting you, wanting to know where you're at, don't care if you're, you know, don't gets upset yeah. with you when you want to spend time with your family that's a red flag <laughs> yeah and some, some you know what sometimes we see that it's oh it's cute he's worried yeah. about me exactly <laughs> that's what i thought too at first i say like, oh it's so cute he's so worried about me he wants to know yeah. where i'm going not realizing yeah. no this is all a control thing this is all yeah. control mm. and then it just progressed from there the subtle comments he would make about the way i would dress or the subtle mm. things he would say that would were hurtful. I didn't see it as abusive, but it really was. I think people need to pay attention to that. Yeah. Early on, were there any like um, isolating you? Did you witness any of yeah. that or experience there any of that? Like I said, the isolating from family. You know, he mm -hmm. didn't, didn't like the fact that I wanted to be around family. He didn't like the fact that mm -hmm. I had friends outside of him. You know, that was a problem. And I try to tell people now, if you're with someone and they have a problem with you, you know, having friends outside of them, outside of their circle, then that's that's a red flag. I mean, all the friends I had during my marriage, and I was married for 26 years, wow. during that marriage were his friends. You know, I, mm. I never really had friends outside of his circle, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Oh, no, that makes a lot of sense. And these are some really good signs, Stephanie, that, you know, we can be aware of if you are, you know, experienced or if you're in a relationship early on, like Stephanie said, some of these things that we feel that is cute uh, might be red flags. And if I hear you correctly, Stephanie, it's, it's good to evaluate that and see, you know what, maybe perhaps can I take a weekend to myself? Exactly. Or, you know, if he, and, and I'm not saying that it, it could be wrong, but my ex sometimes would pick out my clothes and, you know, wear mm. this and wear that. And at the time I thought, oh, this is cute. He's picking out, you know, yeah. not knowing that this is his way of controlling, you know, how I look and what I wear. And right. if I would wear something that he didn't like, he made sure to, to tear it down. If I, if I wore my yeah. hair a certain way and he didn't like it, he made sure to tear it down you know he made sure that to belittle me and make me feel less than what i should have felt you know mm. you would think i would walk out feeling good thinking i look good but he would make sure that no you don't look good you <laughs> you know he would make yeah. me feel worthless i felt very worthless yeah 
Wow. This is your first chapter, the before the storm. The, these are the red flags. These are the before the storm, before you realize that there was an issue. At what point was it the perfect storm, if you will? You know, the perfect storm is like, the white you know, everything's picket. calm and everything's going good. All of a sudden, it just, everything just blows up. And those started happening after we were married, where they would just be, you would, I would think everything's going good. Everything's perfect. And then he would come home and he would just blow up over the littlest thing. If there were dishes in the sink, he would blow up over that. And I would think, okay, we both work. We both, you know, we both live here. We both, we both just walked in the door. You haven't even given me time to do what I'm supposed to do as far as, you know, keeping the house, washing the dishes. And now you're blowing up at me. Or it would just be the subtlest thing. He told me one time, I, he timed how long it took me to get to work. So he said, I know it takes you this long to get to work. Well, how come it takes you this long to come home? Mm. Things like that. And, you know, yeah. like I said, you would think things would be perfect. We would be talking and laughing and, con and then all of a sudden he would bring this up. And it, yeah. then we would start, it would start an argument. And if I yeah. didn't say what he wanted me to say or answer it the way he wanted me to answer it, then it was a problem. Yeah. 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 I think that it's very, um, it's very powerful to recognize these signs early on. And as you talk about it in, in your chapter, The Perfect Storm, and you describe like how the situations escalate and become more, more, um, I'm not going to say. Volatile. I mean, you know, I would yes. fight back and, and I would try to hold my own. But when you're in a relationship with a person of that nature, eventually you grow tired. You just, you know, you're fighting. I'm constantly defending myself. And after a while, you just give up. And I think that's what I did. I just kind of like, okay, I mm -hmm. gave up. You know, I talk about in my book where, you know, I got to the point where I would make sure the house was perfect. I would even yeah. before, you know, I go to bed at night, I would make sure everything was perfect. You know, I would wake up first thing in the morning, make sure everything was perfect. I would make sure the kids were perfect. I made sure everything was perfect, trying to keep the calm, trying to keep the yeah. peace. But there will yeah. always be something. No matter what I did, there was always something that wasn't going to meet his standard. It's like he just kept raising the bar. And every time he'd raise the bar, I would try to, okay, I, I'm, a, I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to do this. You know, perfect. Yeah. Everything was perfect. I had, if you saw us from the outside world, you would think we were the perfect couple. Perfect couple. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people used to tell us, I want to be like y'all. You know, they would envy us. And I would think if you only knew what it was like behind closed doors, you would think again. Yeah, you know, wow, Stephanie, thank you. Thank you for sharing and pointing that out because I think, you know, if we were to all be honest, and this is why I, I love your topic and I love your book, because I think if we were to all be honest and really start, you know, living in the skin that we're in, you know, we'd be able to warn others <laughs> and say, you know what, hey, <laughs> this is how you cannot even get in this <laughs> and have to pretend. You don't want to be a part of this. Um, you know, it's just, I felt like I was constantly trying to seek his approval. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, that's hard. It was hard. Yeah. What was the turning point when you realized that what you needed was to get out of this situation? Well, like and said, what I, did you do specific or what happened specifically and what did you do to get out of it? Well, well, like I said, I stayed for 26 years. So yeah. in between those 26 years, yeah, there were times that I would leave, but I always mm. came back because mm. I always was, always wanted that perfect marriage. I always wanted the fairy tale. I wanted it and I still mm. loved them. And some part of me, well me personally didn't love myself enough to realize Amen. that yeah. this was not a marriage that was going to work. And so eventually I just became numb to mm. everything. I just became, I, I think I talk about it in my book. I became like the Barbie doll, you know, the perfect Barbie doll. I would get up and 
fix myself up and make sure I was perfect, make sure the house was clean, make sure everybody was perfect. And I would just do the, go through the drill. It was like a, a drill, you know, every day. I knew yeah. this, I knew I had to do this, I knew I had to do that. Um, yeah. I think the turning point came for me was when I got in my 40s and yeah. after all of our sons had left, and mm-hmm. it was just me and him in the house. Mm. And it got worse. Mm. Because now it was just me and him in the house. Yeah. Yeah. And so I finally thought, okay, this is not working for me. I was, you know, I was having suicidal thoughts. I was trying to figure mm-hmm. out, you know, I didn't know what else to do to make him happy. I was like, I'm never going to make him happy. I'm never going to be the woman he expects me or keeps drilling the need to be not realizing that I wasn't the problem. I always yes. thought I was the problem. Yes. And so finally, when I decided to leave, I'm like I said, I had left a few times. Yeah. I would always go back. When I finally decided to leave that night, I left something inside of me said, you're not going back. And mm-hmm. I think that that was during the time I had really started. Um, I had found a church. I had started you know, rebuilding my relationship with God. And yeah. I think that was him telling me, okay, this is it. You're not going back. Did and you start making other like, friends? Yeah, it just seemed like he started surrounding me with people to keep me from going back. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I'll tell you, I thought about it. I was you know, even the night I left, I laid in bed thinking, okay, how can I fix this so I can go back? <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Stephanie, I feel your heart. You you just you you love and there's nothing wrong with loving, you know? But I think what you're saying is that you found love within yourself. Right. God I started, showed you who you were. Yes, I started learning how to love myself. I started reading, you know, the word and I started seeing myself the way God saw me. Mm. And so I was like, okay, something needs to change. And, you know, I stopped listening to what he had to say. And I think he realized that because he made a big issue of me going to church. He didn't like it at all. Wow. He didn't like it. Did he? So he didn't go either. Well, he went for a little bit. And, and, And I truly think the only reason he went was to see if I was there to talk to somebody else. Or, you know, flirting. Yeah. Yeah. Because of the whole, con- because he couldn't understand. We would fight, like he would start a fight on, on Saturday night and it would go late. And I would still get up on Sundays and go to church. Yeah. He didn't understand why I would, he couldn't prevent me or stop me from going. Mm. And I feel like he started going to see if maybe I was going because see of some other person at the church. No, <laughs> that wasn't it. <laughs> Who? No, Mm-mm. no, ma'am. Okay, so in your book, you mention the reality of the storm. Now, could you elaborate more on what this means and how it affected your perception of the situation? So it took me a while to realize that this was my reality that this is, you know, this was the person I married and this is how my relationship was going to be forever. It was never going to change. And so that's when I started thinking, okay, is this the life I want to live? Cause like I said, by now I was in my forties. Is this the life I want to keep living? And by the, by now, you know, my sons were adults and it's, am I, what example am I setting? You know, for them, what am I showing them that this is the right way to be? And I had to start thinking about those things. I had to start thinking about my, you know, my my granddaughter. She had been born, and I was thinking, okay, how would I feel if she was in this situation? And I know I don't want, my, you know, so all these things started coming into perspective for me. And so I was like, well, this is my reality, and I, and the only way that I can make a change is to leave. You know, if he's not willing to change, if he's not willing to, like I said, we tried counseling and he didn't like it. 
And so he didn't like it. And so I'm thinking, okay, what else? We tried church and he wasn't really into church. And so I was like, you know, what else can I do to make this work? The reality was either I'm going to stay and die. Well, I was already dead on the inside, but die, you know, really die, physically die from my suit, either my suicidal thoughts or he was going to do it. I'm going to die or either I'm going to leave and try to live this life, you know, that I dream about that God has placed in me. Stephanie, Stephanie, what you said right there, I hope that if any listeners are listening, if you feel that you are at this point right there, this is a good time to see if this is your reality. And if so, like Stephanie said, you have to make a decision to live and live the life that God wants you to live. Stephanie, you're making me get emotional. Okay. No, sorry. Okay. Because you know what? If I could just say this, I think we've all been at a, a point in our lives where we may be either on a job or maybe in a relationship, a partnership, a friendship, and you just feel like, you know what? This is not going to change. You know, this my boss keeps riding me. There's nothing I can do. They're, they're just picking on me at this point. What am I going to do? Am I going to, you know, put in these two week notice and go live the life that I know I deserve? Or am I going to keep coming here, getting beat down and put down and belittled and stifled? We have to make a decision. Do we stay here and die? That's true. Or do we live? Or okay. We I, live? Okay. I get emotional. Okay. Many survivors. <laughs> many survivors. Okay. No, no, go for it. I'm sorry. I mean, you have to think about it because a lot of women, I feel like that's what we do. We just, we stay in places and we know we're dying on the inside. We know we are. We know we're not happy. We know we're not, you know, at a place where we want to be, but we're yeah. scared to take that step. Yeah. Yeah. We're scared to take that step. Yeah. It's the fear of the unknown, you know? It's the fear of the unknown. It's why so many survivors... Like me, they leave and they go back because yeah. the fear of the unknown is it's, it's more comfortable to stay in what you know well, yeah. than to leave and, and you know, and get uncomfortable because that's what happens when you leave. You yeah. get into the uncomfortable. Yeah, until you find your footing. Okay, many survivors experience a cycle of abuse that you, you called this deja vu effect, right? So where... They find themselves drawn to similar to maybe abusive partners or maybe a relationship, kind of like I was talking about before with work or, you know, different habits. Have you had any experiences with these and how have you worked to break that cycle? So um, I have had an experience, a deja vu experience. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'll just use an example that I used in my book. So I was divorced and I thought, well, you know, it's time I can start dating. It had been a few years. And so I met this guy and he was really nice. And I thought, oh, we got to, you know, we get along really good. And, and to be honest with you, there were signs because yeah. I had been in enough therapy to see it, but I yep. kept telling myself, well, maybe it's just me. I'm just being overly cautious and overly, yep. you know, and so I just, I dated this guy for about a month and it was just like deja vu. It was just like I found my, he would say little subtle things and he would make these little comments and he would always try to say, you know, that looks nice on you, but maybe you should try this. Or he had to pick the restaurant and every conversation had to revert back to him, you know? And I mm. thought, uh -oh. hmm, I've seen this before. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh -oh. And then I got yeah, I got mad at myself because I I had seen the I had seen it the red flags, but you know you I wanted to date I, and I thought okay well you know maybe it's just me and I kept overlooking the little things and I think mm -hmm. and then finally it just exploded and I told him I said hey you know I know who I know you I I was married to you and I can't I can't do this again. Like mm. it was the, the whole deja vu. It's like I saw, I knew it, I saw it. But it's still, 
I think like you get, like you said, even as women, I think we will do that in relationships. And it doesn't have to be with our significant other. It could just be with other women, friendships. Yes. Yep. We'll meet a person. We'll be like, mm, you know, I don't, there's something about her I don't like. But instead of yep. listening to that inner voice, we'll just let yep. it slide and we'll just think, oh, well, maybe it's just me. But no. Yeah. No. <laughs> I learned in therapy, when you feel something, you need to feel it and, and pay attention to it. <laughs> Absolutely. It's not going away. It's there for a it's reason. It's not going away. And it's okay to abort the mission. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. I think we've all been there. We have all been there. And I love the, how you put it in, in relation to even as women who, you know, if friendships, yes, it shows up in friendships. And if there's certain behavior that you don't like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of big on, you know, calling it out. I, I I admit that I used to be a runner and I would just be like, done, <laughs> you know? And then I went to also, I'll hold you real tight. And I won't let you go. I went through that stage as well. But now I'm at a stage of peace. You know what it is? It is what it is. It was yeah. hard for me to say no. And so people would play off of that. They'd be like, oh, she'll do it. She'll do it. And I'd be like, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. When deep down inside, I'm like, no, I really don't want to do it. Yeah. Or it was hard for me to tell people, hey, you know, you what you said hurt my feelings. Yeah. It was hard for me to say that. Yeah. It was hard for Why me to have a voice. That, Why do you think that? I think it's still I think it reverts back to my childhood. I think it reverts back to the insecurities that I had growing up. Yeah. That I never dealt with. And I and to be a I always wanted to be a people pleaser and to make people happy and you know, I didn't want to be the one causing confrontation and I didn't want to be the one who everybody was going to um, be upset with. So I would yeah. go along to get along, yeah. even when I didn't like it. Yeah. Yeah. We all I think I think to, to, for a, um, a level of us, uh, many of us have been there. I know I have. I know I have definitely been in that people pleasing and I get it too. And I do believe that when, you know, like you said, it stems from our childhood and that trauma there. Okay. <laughs> I want to oh, and I think look, we real quick yeah. to lower our boundaries. We don't hold our boundaries. You know, yeah. we might tell ourselves, Hey, I'm not going to do that. But then we get in front of that person. We'll be like, okay. Right. <laughs> this last time. And then yeah. you be in the mirror with her. This the last time. Yeah. <laughs> The next yeah. time I'm going to say no, uh, but yeah. keep practicing because you will say no. Okay. I want to talk to you about the surrendering stage of the storm. And I believe that I love this title and it's intriguing to me because it, the surrendering stage of the storm, it, it, that says so much. So can you explain to us what this stage entitles and how to, how we can manage and overcome it? In this chapter, I talked about um, when I surrendered my life back to Christ mm. and I thought, okay, there's no way I'm going to get out of this storm without help. And so, like I said, I had started visiting churches, but I never found a church that I felt was right until I started attending this one church and it just, it just fit. It just felt like I should be there. After a, a Saturday night of arguing, of fighting, one Sunday morning, I sat there by myself at church and I just, I, I cried, you know, to myself, but it is, I'm crying on the inside and I'm saying, okay, God, you know, I, I don't know what else to do. I, I didn't want to go back home. I knew my ex was sitting at home waiting for me. And I'm thinking church is about out and I'm like, what am I going to do? And then at that moment, our pastor called altar call. And in that moment I said, okay, I'm just going to surrender and see where this takes me. And that's exactly what I did. I just surrendered. I, I got up, I, got, I went to altar call. I joined church that day. After that, I started praying more. You know, I had always been praying, but then I, I became a, pray war, a prayer warrior. <laughs> and then I just started getting more involved. I started attending Bible study. That way I would know scripture for myself. And, you know, not from somebody else telling me that I would know and understand how God saw me for my, you know, for myself. And yeah. I just surrendered and I just followed his will. And it just seemed like I said, it just seems like he started 
placing people around me that would pour into me and that would feed into me. And I thought, well, how do all these people know? It's funny. We think we can wear the mask and cover up and nobody knows what's going on. Yeah. But people knew what was going on. I mean, how do they know? The same way you would know if you've seen it. Yep. Same way you would know. You know, I, I used to always, you know, with my past trauma and abuse, and I would always say, Lord, but why? You know, why me? But <laughs> I never knew and understood that now I can see it. I can see it before anybody ever opens their mm -hmm. mouth. And I know where I was, and maybe perhaps people could see it in me, but if you would have said something to me, I would be like, uh uh. I know, right? I was perfect. I'm together, honey. <laughs> I'm mm -mm, perfect. What you talking about? Not perfect. Nothing yes. going on. You know. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. But they, but they know because they see but themselves. They, they see themselves. Okay. Um. I love. I love the surrendering stage. I hear when you said the surrendering for you is. Uh. I all I keep kept hearing was not my will but Thy will. So that's it. That's all I. You know, whatever you say, Lord. Here I am. That's what I'm gonna do. And. Yeah. I try to follow it to the T. I, even to this day, I still wake up and say, hey, you know, Lord, I surrender. Yeah. Take me, I use me, that. use me as your vessel. Yeah. I, I still say that every morning when I wake up. Yeah, I love that. And I think it's something we all need to do. I'm, I'm, I'm going to adopt that one. I want to adopt that one. You know, lay down my lay down my will because sometimes, especially, I feel that you know when it's when you come from a place where you are you are so used to being controlled, right? It's hard to take your hands off of everything. It's hard to just let go. So I I love that. That's something that I have to continue to do. I know I I. I it's so funny. I listen to Joel Olstein almost every day, and my kids were like, "Cause at the end he'll say, do you want to give your life to Christ?' And you know he'll have you repeat, um, repeat the prayer. And I repeated every day. And my sons are like, "Mom, you did that yesterday. Why you do it every day? Because uh, your flesh must die daily." <laughs> Anytime before I leave my apartment in the morning, I always stop at the door and I always say, <laughs> "You know, okay, God, use me. Open my eyes to see." Yeah. Open my ears to hear and give yeah. me the right words to say. I yes. always say it before I walk out my door because, like you said, once you get outside your door, you know, you might be happy inside, but once you get outside, <laughs> yes, somebody gonna try. No, no I'm just kidding. somebody Sorry. gonna try you. Yes, <laughs> you're like, I'm trying to do better. Why are you doing this to me? <laughs> Like, I'm okay. trying, Lord, I'm trying. <laughs> somebody going to cut you off in traffic or yeah. somebody, you know, it's going to be something. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's the enemy working. Okay. All right. The whisper. So when you talk about the whisper, and for me, I feel like it kind of suggests like God's calling, right? And um, so you suggest, you say that, you know, you think about like a higher calling, a higher purpose and calling you after the after surviving domestic violence. Now, can you share with us a little bit more about what this this whisper meant for you and how it impacted your life moving forward? So the whisper was, like you said, it was after I had left. And I was, so when I left my ex-husband, I moved in with my sister. And okay. after I had left her, you know, I was really struggling because like I said, I was in my marriage for 26 years. I had known this for 26. This is my, this had been my life since I was 18. Right, right. And so to start, and then, like I said, his friends were my friends. So I didn't have any friends. I really didn't have. So I felt so alone. And then yeah. sometimes I would be like, oh, I'm so alone. And then I would hear a voice that say, you're not alone. And, you know, that would be God. Or I think at one time I was, I told myself, I'm just going to leave Dallas. I'm just going to move away and start all over. And then something inside of me said, the whisper said to me, um, moving won't fix it. Mm, 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 you know, mm. and it was just the, the subtle things that he, mm. that he would say, or he would have other people say, like my therapist would say things to me and I'd be like, why is she saying that to me? You know, she, she, at one therapy, in one therapy session, she made me really look at myself. She said, she told me, she said, yes, your, your ex, your your ex-husband was abusive to you but you stayed mm. she said you wouldn't leave she said doesn't that bother you that you felt it was okay to be treated that way 
And I had never thought about it like that. No, no, no. Mm, I had that made never thought okay. about it like that. Mm. You know, and so it would just be the little things that I think, and I think it was God. Like I said, he would tell, he would always tell me, you're not alone. You know, you're not by yourself. I got you. You can, because tr I had trust issues. I would yeah. always hear, you can trust me. I would always <laughs> question every, I questioned everything. Yeah. Like you said, yeah. everything I questioned. Yeah. Even when people were just trying to be friendly and be my friend, I'd be like, you know, what you want with me? What are you? Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Who are you? Yep. Wait a minute. Exactly. I don't know you. <laughs> yep. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Absolutely. I was very closed off. And, yeah. And so my therapist, you know, she would say things like that. She's like, you know, maybe you should think about learning how to forgive yourself. And I thought, what I got to forgive myself for? <laughs> Yeah, I do that. <laughs> you know, and she was like, you know, did you ever think about, like she said, did you ever think about you stayed? You stayed for 26 years. You, you thought it was okay. You got comfortable in it. She said, don't you ever wonder why you did? Mm, 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 mm. That was deep. That was deep. Yeah, that was, you know, like I said, it would just be yeah. the little, even now, the little whispers I get from God will say, you know, sometimes I get discouraged in my walk and I, you know, he'll be like, and he'll be like, well, Stephanie, I got you. You know, you, you, don't worry. I'm here. I, I got you. Or yeah. I would tell myself, you know, I wrote this book and because after I wrote the book, there was a lot of um, backlash from certain people. <laughs> We're not going to say, but, you know, okay. so God, you know, and I, and I prayed and I said, okay, God, you know, I felt like you told me to tell my Maybe. story. I felt like you told me to do this. And now I'm getting all this backlash. Did I make a mistake? Did I not hear you? And then he'd be like, no, you are right. You know, your fault, you're on the right path. You know, he would just yeah. let me know I'm on the right path. He was do yeah. little things or he would say little things or I would get emails from other women or I would get text messages or DMs from people saying, hey, I read your book. You yeah. know, I even had one lady send me a DM that says, you know, your book helped me to leave my abusive marriage. And I thought, wow. Okay, God, I hear you. You know, yeah. I hear you. Ooh, I get so emotional just listening. I hear your heart, and um, I hear your heart so much. And I, I love the fact that one, you wrote your book and you told your story. And anytime you you rough you you um, ruffle the ruffle feathers, anytime you you know touch the wall, it's gonna it's gonna ripple. You're gonna get some ripple effects. You're gonna get you're gonna get some backlash. But you know what? The truth truth hurts and also the truth will set you free and many others free i wish you know okay i'm not i'm not gonna do it okay you talked about you talked about forgiveness and forgiveness is a cha is challenging concept for many survivors so how did you navigate your journey towards forgiveness if what well, you said you did, um, but how did you navigate your journey towards forgiveness and what advice would you give others who may be struggling with forgiveness? So for me, forgiveness, I had to go back to my childhood. Mm. And these are things I had to learn because I never knew my dad. Mm. And so, you know, me and my mom had a very strange uh, relationship. Our relationship was hard. Yeah. And so I had to go back and learn how to forgive them. You know, for years yeah. I thought, why didn't my dad want to know me? You know, mm -hmm. he had other kids, but he never wanted to know me. Mm. And so, you know, those are, like I said, childhood traumas. People don't realize they carry those into adulthood. Yeah. And so I had to go back and make peace with that. And then I had to go back and make peace with my mom. You know, yeah. I had to realize she was just doing what she knew how to do. The best she knew. Yeah. That's what she, and that's what she did. And then I had to learn how to forgive myself because I think I was still stuck in this perfect mode. You know, everything had to be perfect. I had to learn that it's okay to be imperfect. <laughs> I had to be able to forgive myself. You know, okay, I'm going to make a mistake and forgive myself for making that mistake and move forward. And then I had to also learn that forgiveness was more for me than it is for the other person. And so even though 
I knew my relationship with my ex-husband would always be, um, we would, we will never reconcile. I know that we'll never be like friends. I had to be able to forgive him so I could move forward or I would take all that hurt and anger into my next relationship. And I don't want to do that. Absolutely. Forgiveness is hard. You know, people, it's hard. Forgiveness is very hard, Stephanie. It is very hard because it's like you're you're still looking at these wounds, if you will, right? Exactly. And every time you these scars and you and you know what they mean every time you look at them. Every time and, and the smallest thing can trigger you. Trigger. It could be, you know, yep. like for me, um, my ex husband, he was an alcoholic. He drinks. He was an alcoholic. Mm. So it it when I'm around people that drink, it's a mm. trigger for me. Mm. And so I have to know, I had to learn what things triggered me and I had yeah. to learn how to overcome those. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. that, that, that all plays into forgiveness because if you yeah. don't, you, you'll find yourself walking around harboring all the hatred and the resentment inside of you. Yeah. Oh, that's good. I, you know, I, I like that. I like a couple of points that you said. I want to just highlight again, forgiveness is not for them. It's for yourself. Mm, that is so true. And knowing what it is that triggers you or, you know, that brings up those memories, because you know what, if I know, you know, it, like, like you said, drinking will bring up some emotions. I'm going to think twice about, you know, perhaps going to this bar or being around this girlfriend because, you know, how she get. I think that's good because we, we think twice about our environments then. Um, so that that was very powerful. Thank you for saying that because I think that does fall into our forgiveness because it's okay to know your limits and say, you know, I'm not going to put myself in that. And I also think people should also be aware of what they will accept and what they won't accept. That's good. Like for me, if someone says they're going to do something or, or, or going to be somewhere, then coming from where I come from, I need to see that. I need to see it. And I'll let them know up front. Don't yeah. say you're going to do it if you can't do it. Don't That's say right. it <laughs> because I'm expecting it. <laughs> right. And when you don't do it, it's a, it sets a off. A, yeah. It's like, it sets off a hurt inside of me and it triggers yeah. a whole lot of things. Yeah. 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 So I know that tell people don't make the promise if you can't keep it. Yes. Yes, I I couldn't agree more with that. I could not agree more with that. Knowing your boundaries, knowing when when and where you you're going to say, you know what? No, that's my cutoff line. I'm not doing that. That's that's too hard. Okay, I want to ask you one more question. Then I want to go into your book. Okay, so you talk about in your book, and you concluded with the brand new me. Ah. Uh, could you share how you have transformed and rebuilt your life after leaving your abusive relationship? So brand new me is basically, like you said, I rebuilt my whole life. It's like I did a, um, a renovation. It's like yes. I talk and I have a chapter like that in my book. It's called, it's like I did, I worked from the inside yes. to make sure the outside looked okay. Because a lot, I think a lot of people would think, oh, well, I'll just go get my hair did, or I'll just go do this, or yeah. I'll, I'll go. Get and they started. fix the outside, <laughs> but they're still, on the inside, they're still, you know, carrying Broken. and harboring all these old past wounds. Yeah. And so for me, um, the brand new me is all about, I learned how to self-care, yeah. take care of myself. Therapy is a big part of it. And yeah. I learned how to just build myself up. I post affirmations all around. I keep, I try to keep myself positive. I try to spend time with myself. Yeah. Because one thing my aunt told me, she said, you need to learn to be comfortable being with yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people miss that and they think we need, uh, you know, they think they need other people to make yeah. them happy and to make them be okay when you really need to learn to be okay with yourself. With yourself. And so a brand new me was like learning, experiencing things that, you know, I would never have done. The old self would have never done. Like, yeah. um, I talk about how I went to a pole dance class and I talk about. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just living life. <laughs> nice. 
you know, things that, yeah, you know, you know, who would ever thought that I would go, you know, the old me would have never done that. But the new me was like, hey, I can try this. And I loved yes. it. It was fun. Yes. Um, you know, I talk about spending time with myself. And yeah. like I said, just spending quality time with myself and learning yeah. how to make sure my inner peace is okay. You know, yeah. I spend time in the word. I, I spend time meditating. I spend time going for walks by myself. I I surround myself with people that I feel that are going to lift me up and be truthful with me. Even when I'm wrong, you know, I have a circle of friends that even when I'm wrong, I quick to say, hey, Steph, you're wrong. Yeah. And I can accept that because they are really, they have They're my best cool. interests at heart. The brand of me was like my, my chapter. I was just saying, you know, here I am. I'm okay with my flaws. I love myself for who I am. I know that I'm imperfect. I know that I'm a child of God. I know that I've been, you know, he He created me for a purpose. I know yeah. that I need to try to walk in that purpose. And I, yeah. I still can enjoy life. You know, people think when you become a Christian or when you become a believer that you're supposed to stop life. moving. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. that's not the case. I mean, if you start living your life for God, you still have a life, but yeah, you do choose. You walk away from your past, which are past things that weren't good for you anyway. But he always replaces new things for you to do. He always keeps you intrigued and can, and, and moving closer to him. So, yeah, that yeah. was the brand new me. It's just, like I said, I'm, 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 I feel fierce and courageous. Yes. Yeah, you know, I'm not afraid to, to, to write to a book. A voice. Yeah, <laughs> to write a book. <laughs> to write a book. Right. Be I'm a not witness. afraid to do that. Yeah, I'm yeah. not afraid to witness. I'm not afraid to share my testimony. Yeah, um, so like it's that. just it's it's a whole new thing. It's just when you let them in, you be, you would be amazed at how he yeah. will change your life if you just let them. Uh, you know. I hear when you're talking and, and I love, I love the brand new me because it's, it's, it's so important that you embrace that brand new you. It almost, I, two things I don't want to forget. One, I hear just here, your, your latter days will be better than your former days. Right. And so that leads me to say, even that brand new you, you're no longer held in captivity. Now you can actually go out and do and be what God has created you to do and be. And it doesn't mean that every day is going to be perfect. Right. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have challenges or struggles. It just yeah. means that you'll have a peace when you go yeah. through those things. Because yeah. you know you're not going through them alone. That's good. That's so good. Okay, Stephanie, before we let you go, and I, I, I know you got to get back to work. So tell us where we can find your book at. My book is available everywhere books are sold. <laughs> hey, yes. <laughs> so pretty. Love it. Yeah, I wore the up. color to match your book today. Huh? I wore the color to match your book. Show them again. Oh, yes, you did. You did. <laughs> I did that on purpose. I love that book. Love the cover and everything. <laughs> yeah, that's okay, so uh, it's, it's available on Amazon or anywhere books are sold. You can buy, you can purchase it. And you know, actually, this picture. What's not supposed to be the cover. Ah. But this one, so when we when she took this picture, the person who took this picture, we were uh -huh. testing the lighting and we were laughing and joking and she snapped the camera. And then afterwards, the when we saw that picture, we were like, oh, that's the picture. <laughs> that is it. Oh, I just see peace. I see joy, restoration in that picture. Stephanie, thank you so much for telling us. And we'll also leave it in the description below. Please get this book, ladies. I know that it's going to help you out and anyone who you may feel that is struggling in that position, please send it to them. Stephanie, give us some closing words to take with us throughout the week. I just want to let women know or whoever's watching this video that, you know, that you were created and you do have a purpose. Don't let anyone ever tell you that you don't. Don't ever let anyone devalue you. Don't ever let anyone take away what you feel inside, what God has placed in you, because he has placed in all of us that we are worthy. I mean, he tells us in the Bible that we are loved, that we are his workmanship. So don't let anybody take that away from you. Oh, Stephanie, 
I want to thank you so much for sharing that with us. I want to thank you for being vulnerable. I want to thank you for coming here and being a witness. And thank you for joining me. <laughs> I just want to thank all of our listeners for listening, tuning in to another episode of Woman Witness Podcast, The Stories at the Well. If you were blessed by something you heard, we ask that you forward this episode to someone, forward it to a friend, follow Stephanie on social media. Follow Woman Witness Podcast as well. Subscribe, like, pick up the book. So thank you. And perhaps, just maybe perhaps, you were chosen for such a time as this to write, to tell your story, your truth. Until next time. Bye. Bye.